Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's just close our eyes and quieten our hearts before the Lord today. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your overwhelming presence in this place. We can feel your love as we sit and we stand here in your presence, Lord. Father, I pray and I thank you, Lord, that you will open eyes and ears and hearts and minds and bring new revelation. I pray that your word will penetrate and take root in the hearts of your people. I bind up any blinding spirits, any spirits of confusion that hinder your people from hearing your word, Lord. Let nobody leave here unchanged today. Lord, for it is written that your word will not return void. It shall accomplish what you please and it shall prosper in the thing that you have sent it for. I make it known now that I do not rely on my own understanding, my own abilities, my own preparation and I give the floor to the Holy Spirit now. Let the words that come out of my mouth be only yours, Lord. All the honor and the glory and the praise be to you, God. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 So I heard a pastor once say that if you are not sold out to Jesus, you are still on sale to the devil. <laughs> Can I say that again? If you are not sold out to Jesus, you are still on sale to the devil. It's one that hurts a bit, eh? It's one that makes us sit upright and to think, oh, I need to think about this one. To be sold out in essence means total faithfulness and devotion. All that we are, all that we have, are laid down for Jesus. At his feet, we bring it and we leave it there. If we are sold out to Jesus, our body, our soul, and our spirit is completely, totally his. This means that we, we voluntarily give total control of our lives to him. We are no longer in the driving seat. We are no longer the driver. So why should we be sold out to Jesus? If we look at 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, it says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We were bought with a price, a costly price. Jesus bought his church, us as believers, he bought us with his precious blood. That should be enough reason to be totally sold out to him. When you purchase a product, is half of it yours or is everything yours? Let me just give you this example. Say, for instance, you go to the shop and you're looking for a nice chest of drawers. And now the salesperson interests you in this huge one, nice big, and you think, okay, this is going to sort out my life. You know all the things that we have and we don't have space for it. It's a huge one and you load it, you pay for it, you load it on the bucky. And just as you're about to drive off, the salesperson comes running out and says, wait, wait, sorry, I forgot to tell you. Only the top two drawers you can use, the rest belongs to somebody else. Would you be happy with that? You paid full price for it. Sure. Another example that I want to give you. Say for instance, a king went and bought a castle. Now you know a castle is very expensive. This king moves into the castle, he moves into the right wing, and then he finds out the left wing is occupied by his enemy. Do you think a king 
would be happy with it. Like I said, family, then why do we do that to our King Jesus? We come to him, we come to his, lay down at his feet and we say, save me, Lord, save me. But then we say, you can have this half of me, this half, I still want to be in the world. If we are not sold out to Jesus, we are still on sale to the devil, which means that we open up opportunities for him because we are not totally surrendered to Jesus. How can we give half of us to God when he gave us everything? It's either all or nothing, family. As true believers, we should generally desire to live in obedience to God's commands. You cannot walk with Jesus and the world at the same time. They're going in different directions. If we are true believers, we will naturally depart from sin. Yes, we will still sin. But when we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, the Holy Spirit will convict us and we will confess. We will come to Jesus with what we did wrong. When we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, our nature has changed. We no longer walk the same, we don't talk the same, we don't do the same things. When we have changed and have that new nature, the things that we used to watch our entertainment changes. Secular music, worldly music, does not sound the same anymore. Because quite frankly, if you listen to that, the rubbish that you hear in most of the songs, it is terrible. You no longer uh, laugh at the same jokes that you used to. You don't no, no longer make the same jokes that you used to because it's not funny anymore. You no longer hang out in the places that you used to love to go because there's no attraction anymore. We cannot be one foot in the world and the other in the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Just take note again, the, the word of God is very specific. It says there, all things. It doesn't say some things. It doesn't say what you want to. All things have changed. If we have given our life to Jesus and we haven't changed a bit, we are fooling ourselves. What does the Bible say about sin and our relationship with God? In Isaiah 59, verse 2, from the New King James Version, it says, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. Sin separates us from God. It's like the static that you hear on a two-way radio. The person can't hear clearly, or they cannot communicate at all. Now, what do we do to clear up the static? The solution is repentance and sanctification. This clears up the static and opens up our communication, and it opens up a wonderful intimate relationship with God. 1 John 1 verse 9 in the New King James Version says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yet again, as with many things in the Word, there's something we need to do. The Word of God says we cannot be just hearers of the Word, we need to be doers. We need to come to Him 
and ask him for forgiveness. It is very important to actively choose to separate ourselves from sinful behaviors and actions. It's a choice that we make. The title of the message for today is Meet Him at the Threshing Floor. The threshing floor is a place of crushing, place of cleansing, place of purification, sanctification. And we have divine appointments with Jesus at the threshing floor. But before I get into that, there's such a rich history behind the threshing floors in the Bible that I had to confess to Pastor John, I almost had myself in trouble because of that. Um, going down rabbit holes where I wasn't supposed to be, God gave me a message and I got this, ooh, oh, wow. And I wanted to bring it all to you today, but God pulled me like a little child back and said, whoa, this is not what I want you to share today. So please take this as an introduction because there's still a lot to be shared. If it will be me or any of the other pastors, I don't know. But when it's God's time, that message will come. But just to interest you a bit in just a bit of that intricate history. King David sinned against God when he took an unlawful census of his people. And he felt convicted. And then he went and he bought a threshing floor. He then built an altar. He went to worship God, sacrificed to him. And you know what happened later on that same threshing floor? The temple of Solomon was built on that exact same spot. And if you go back years before David, that is the exact same spot where Abram took Isaac sure. to be offered. And then God provided the ram for the sacrifice. And Abram called that place, God will provide, Jehovah Jireh. So if that doesn't get you interested and excited about the subject, I don't know. I was really, I was all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get back to the message for today. So if you look at threshing floors, they are flat surfaces, usually smooth, where the harvest was brought to be processed. Before the harvest came, of course, the people had to go to the fields, cut down the stalks, and then they would bring it to the threshing floor, and there two processes happened. The first one is the threshing. With the threshing, the wheat is loosened from the chaff. And while one man stirred up the sheaves, another rode over it in a cart equipped with rollers uh, instead of wheels. Sharp stones or bits of iron were attached to the cylinders to help separate the husks from the grain. The cart was called a tribulum. Now an interesting fact just to hold on for on, on to a bit for a bit later. Oh, a bit later. There it goes. You see, I told you. Um, just for a bit later, is that tribulum is the origin for the word tribulation. We'll speak about that a bit later. Winnowing is the next process that takes place. Winnowing is when the grain, the chaff, is separated by wind. Because there's a need for wind in this process, threshing floors were normally on high hilltops or on open fields where the wind could come rushing through. So the bro broken stalks are tossed in the air with a winnowing fork. And then, because the chaff is lighter than the grain, it is blown away. While the grain that we are actually looking for falls to the floor. And then it is gathered. So while the threshing floor is a physical space for chaff and grain to be separated, it symbolizes far more. 
The threshing floor is a place where good is separated from bad, true from false. And you've heard many times from the, this pulpit that we know that from Genesis to Revelation, everything is about Jesus. If it is not spoken directly about him, there are types used that foreshadow what is still to come. In Colossians 1 verse 15 to 17, in the English Standard Version, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's all about Jesus. There are three ways that we can find and see Jesus in the threshing floor. The first one is as Christ, our Redeemer, at the threshing floor of redemption. Now first, if we look at this, I want to share with you a very important meeting took place on a threshing floor in the Old Testament. And this is where the story, story of Ruth and Boaz comes in. And I'm just going to paraphrase this shortly for time's sake. So we know that Naomi's husband died and her sons, leaving herself and Orpah and Ruth as widows. Naomi then asked them to rather go back to, to their families, to find a new family, um, a husband and have kids. Orpah left, but Ruth stuck to Naomi. She didn't want to go anywhere. Now in those times there was nothing worse than being a widow and being without sons. And to be in the position means loss of income and support and ultimately loss of property. But Naomi remembers about an old law of Moses in which a relative can redeem someone's property after he dies. Naomi's husband is related to the Boaz, Achtu, Boaz, and therefore Boaz can redeem the fields as Naomi's husband. And with the fields would come Naomi and Ruth. Naomi sends Ruth to Boaz on the threshing floor, and she lays down in humbleness at his feet. And God uses the, th the threshing floor to provide redemption for them through Boaz. The book of Ruth is an account of redemption and hope. They were redeemed from poverty to abundance and from hopelessness to a bright future. Does that sound familiar to you? This is what Jesus does for us. Ruth is a type of us, the church, while Boaz is a type of the Redeemer, our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Just like Naomi and Ruth needed redemption, so do all of us. Redemption is simply an act of saving or being saved. In this instance, we are being saved. This is an example of our very first meeting with Jesus on the threshing floor. It points towards our salvation when we become a child of God. In Psalm 103, verse 2 to 4, in the New King James Version, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. How beautiful. This very important divine appointment at the threshing floor 
as when we meet Jesus, laying at his feet, giving our lives to him like he gave his life to us. When we come humbly, he redeems us and he saves us. The next one is Christ our sanctification, the threshing floor of sanctification. This is a total different place. This is where you get crushed and tested and purified, cleansed, sanctified. Now let's just look at what is sanctification. Sanctification is to live a holy life and become more Christ-like. To sanctify an object means to wash, cleanse, consecrate or set it aside for a special purpose. It is a process in which God transforms a person, making them fit for a holy purpose. It is to live a holy life and become more Christ-like. The th uh, threshing floor process is a beautiful picture of worship and a metaphor for sanctification. Where we come before the Lord at his feet and let him break down what is impure. The impurities are separated from us and blown away in the winnowing process as the wind lifts it and carries it away. In Hebrews 12 verse 14 in the Christian Standard Bible, it says, Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Pursue means to run after or chase. If we do not chase holiness, we will not see the Lord. Can you see how important holiness is? Is to the Lord. The importance of being set apart for his purposes. If we claim to belong to the Lord, we should not only profess our faith, but also demonstrate it through our actions. It's very important. As I said, this is a place of crushing. To be porters or carriers of the presence of God, our path will lead through this threshing floor. Why? Because to carry the presence of God, you have to be holy. This is where we grow, where we are processed, sanctified, and even broken in order to produce the best of who we are in the Lord. Threshing may be necessary before a blessing. Threshing may be necess necessary before breakthrough. Who wants blessing? Yes. Who wants breakthrough? Yes. But we're not prepared to go through the crushing. It is here that we are tried, tested and molded through the trials of life. As believers, we will find ourselves on the threshing floor with trials and tests, life circumstances that threatens to crush and destroy. When afflictions come to us, we may think of ourselves as being torn into pieces under cruel pressures of adverse circumstances. Yet the purpose of the tribulum was not to tear up the sheaves, but to expose the grain, the most precious part of the crop. Remember we spoke about the tribulum earlier and that it, the origin of the word tribulation comes from there. And what does tribulation mean? It means a cause or a state of great suffering. John 16, 33 in the New King James Version. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. 
The outer husk of the wheat represents what we are so desperately clinging to, that's part of this world. We need to look unto Jesus who have overcome this world to help us let go of what is of the world. Don't fear the crushing. There is hope in the crushing. We must be reminded that we are the grains as well that are being divided by our nature. We sin and therefore we have chaff. But Jesus separates us from our chaff if we repent and lay it down. The last threshing floor I want to speak about is when we meet Jesus as our judge. This is the threshing floor of judgment. Threshing is often used as a symbol for God's judgment. In this instance, at this particular threshing floor, we meet Jesus as judge. And here the wheat will be separated from the chaff. This is the final separation between good and evil. This will be our final appointment with Jesus on the threshing floor. There is no longer a choice to attend. You had a choice to come to number one and number two, redemption and sanctification. There is no choice when it comes to this one. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, you will have to attend. Winnowing, the final threshing and winnowing is compulsory for everyone. For many, sadly, this will be their first meeting with Jesus. And then it will be too late. <coughs> Luke 3 verse 16 to 17 in the English Standard Version says, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy, fire, Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John describes the church that Jesus bought and paid for with his blood as being his threshing floor. The precious grain that is being spoken of in this part of scripture is the righteous, it's the bride of Christ. They are gathered into his barn, this represents heaven, his kingdom. And the chaff, the unrighteous, will be blown away and it will be burnt in unquenchable fire, which is hell. Sorry about that. That one just gets me. <laughs> we are so unprepared. And there's so many people that will not make it. And it makes my heart sad and I can feel God's sadness for that. We need to make sure that we're on the right page. Have that intimate relationship. Be in right standing with him. If we do not meet him at the threshing floor of redemption and sanctification, we will not know him and we will not have eternal life. It is truly sad to see many professing Christians that have been saved for decades, but they have never grown in holiness and in relationship with the Lord. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing him. So you know me and questions, I've got two for you today. The first one, do you know him? Ask yourself that and answer truthfully 
It's very important. In Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, in the New King James Version, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast our demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Many people are doing good works for God, but they will not enter heaven because they don't have that relationship with him. Because they do what they do for themselves and for the honor. There's people that standing behind pulpits that will not go to heaven. The next question I want to ask you, does God know you? Does he really know you? Are you sitting at his feet daily? <coughs> Many will miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance from their head to their heart. They know about Christ, but do not know him. You can be religious. Let me say that again. You can be religious, but lost. You can have the Bible in your head, but not have Christ in your heart. You can come to church for 50 years and not know Jesus. So how do we grow up in our faith? How do we mature? How do we solve this problem? We go back to that second threshing floor and we keep on visiting it. The threshing floor of sanctification. It's not one that we can visit only once. 1 Peter 1 verse 15 to 16 in the English Standard Version says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. We are called to be holy. It speaks about our conduct, our behavior. And not just the parts that we choose, all of it. We grow in, ho in holiness. It's not something that happens overnight, but if we sit at his, at his feet, it will happen for us. The departure from sin is an ongoing process of sanctification in our lives as believers, because no one is without sin. This is not based on legalistic rules, but rather on heartfelt devotion to God and a desire to honor him in all areas of our lives. I'm nearly done. A quote that I want to read to you. Holiness is nothing else but the habitual and predominant devotion and dedication of soul and body and life and all that we have to God. Everything and esteeming and loving and serving and seeking him before all the pleasures and prosperity of the flesh. There are some things that, we must, that must be removed in order for us to grow in holiness. Impurities that needs to go. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's anger, resentment, whatever it might be. We need to come and lay those things down at the feet of Jesus. It's an ongoing process, like forgiveness. You think you've got it and then you feel, oh, again, you want to get to that person. But it's an ongoing process. Every day, lay down at the feet of Jesus. We cannot profess to be a Christian if we willfully continue to sin against God. The sin that we refuse to forsake is our 30 pieces of silver. Do you know what that refers to? Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. We do the same 
if we continue in our way, own way after God has spoken to us. The power lies in surrender at the threshing floor. We have to learn to drop face down on the floor and let God do what he needs to do. If we do not meet Jesus at the threshing floor as our Redeemer and then as our sanctification, we will meet him but once only as our judge. We need to ensure that when that day comes, we are not counted as Jeff. In closing, what if we are chained by life and not even aware, aware of it? Aware of those things that are holding on to us, that are putting us into bondage. This is why that open relationship with God is so important. So that he can tell us, convict us, love us into the person that he wants us to be. We need to lay down and say, I surrender everything before you. Change my mind and heart about anything that I might not be seeing clearly. We often don't see things clearly, family. We think we do. It's painful to surrender to his process of refinement, but it's so worth it. We must submit and offer up our pride, our fears and resentments to the winnowing breath of the Holy Spirit. It's in this place of wholehearted surrender that God can and will move powerfully to heal your heart and take you to new depths of relationship with him. Bring those painful situations, the issues that has kept you in bondage, Bring, him, bring it to him, family. I know many people think it's a shame and an embarrassment to come to the altar, to come to the threshing floor. But you know what? Sometimes being strong doesn't look like you're keeping it all together. Sometimes being strong looks like letting it all fall apart at his feet in complete surrender. I once told Pastor John, if I have to come every day that I can, I will come to the front to get my problems sorted. No matter if I come five times in the same day, we need to do what we need to do to be in right standing with God. God isn't after your perfection, he is after your surrender. And as we surrender, he promises to complete the good work that he has started in you. Come meet him at the threshing floor while there is still time. It is here where you can be redeemed and sanctified before the day of judgment. What's meant to save your soul will sometimes hurt the flesh. It's worth the pain in the end, though, because the end is, is really just the beginning for us as children of God. Let's pray, family. I want to open up an invitation if the Lord is speaking to you today. If you haven't met him yet on the threshing floor of redemption, he asks you to come today and lay it all down before him. Let him save you. Let him help you. Then if there are some of you that have given your life to the Lord, but you're not quite sure if you really know him, if you maybe have stepped out of his will, if there's sin that is causing static between you and God and you can't hear him, come to the threshing floor of sanctification today. And let him help you and heal you and make you holy like you're supposed to be. Lord, in your tender mercy, we meet you at the threshing floor. Through the process of refinement, reveal in us that which honors you and that which 
which separates us from you. Draw us in, Father, to come humbly and lay at your feet. We thank you for the promise of redemption and sanctification. We thank you, Lord, that we can be your children and that you lead us every step of the way. Father, I pray your blessing over all your people, Lord. I pray that your angels encamp around each and every one, wherever they may go. All the praise and the honor and the glory is yours, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.